Hello friends, welcome to Science Talk. I am your host and resident oceanographer, Jim Massa. Okay, so think of this as like a follow-up uh, video to the video that I recently uh, posted where I ex explain why sea ice seems to be melting earlier in the year. In that video, I address that question because I, I often get uh, asked, the sun is not high enough, is not sufficient energy being imparted by the sun. So how is it possible that sea ice, you know, is melting earlier in the season? We, we understand why it, it, takes, it, it takes longer, why the freeze up occurs later in the year, but why is the melting earlier in the year? A perfectly legitimate question. And you know, as I basically, uh, you know, discussed in that video, it's the heat uh, intrusion, the heat, the transport of warmer water through not only the Bering Strait, but also the, uh, through the Fram Strait. Now, this particular article I'm going to share with you here, they only uh, considering what's happening through the Bering Strait. You need to keep in mind that there's also massive heat in the water being introduced through the Fram Strait uh, that is also contributing to the early uh, melting of the sea ice. So when people ask that question, I, and, I, and I made that, uh, you know, I so, said, well, it's the heat being brought in from specifically on the specific side, the Japanese current, and, uh, and then basically the... Uh, the break off from the North Atlantic drift, which is from the Gulf Stream into the Arctic Ocean through the Fram Strait. So people have been making you know, kind of a, ooh, wow, heat bomb has been making a big deal out of this. And I'm just like, well, I could have told you that, but I guess we're not all oceanographers. So that's, that's why I'm here for you guys, right? Anyway, so there's a, uh, so they have the heat bomb destroying the Arctic sea ice, okay. So um, that's a picture of a, one of the devices that they're using to collect data. A team led by physical oceanographers from Scripps Institution of Oceanography at UCAL San Diego shows in a new study how plumes of warm water flowing into the Arctic Ocean from the Pacific Ocean and accelerating sea ice melt from below. Let me stress, it is also warm water flowing in from the Atlantic Ocean through the Fram Strait as well. I need to stress that. Research is funded by the Office of Naval Research describing an underwater heat bombs. And this is a term that the researchers came up with as one of many mechanisms by which global warming, driven by what the humans are doing, is changing the nature of the Arctic Ocean faster than nearly any other place on Earth. It adds to a growing body of evidence that suggests the, that Arctic sea ice, a source of global climate stability, could disappear for larger portions of the year. What they're, of course, referring to are blue ocean events. And according to the model, and now I think when you add in this uh, factor here that the predictions of the Arctic Ocean being ice-free year-round by 2035, it may turn out to be a couple years earlier. We'll have to see. But certainly seems to be headed in that direction. The rate of accelerating sea ice melt in the Arctic has been difficult to predict accurately due to all the complex local feedbacks between ice, ocean, atmosphere. This work showcases the large role in warming the ocean water plays as part of those feedbacks, said Jennifer McKinnon, a physical oceanographer at Scripps and the lead author of the paper, which appears in the journal Nature Communications. Now, at, at, after I go through the text here, I'm going to play this little video for you. So hang on for that. So Dr. Uh, I guess Yuang Dijern Len, who's a physical oceanographer at Bangor's University School of Ocean Sciences, it was a privilege for us to collaborate with our US colleagues to collect the biogeochemical measurements 
made during the field experiment. These nutrients and isotope data were useful in tracing the origin of the plume, enabled us to explore the impact of the plume dynamics on deep nutrient supply to the phytoplankton carried out from the shelf seas into the central Beaufort Sea Basin. Okay, Beaufort Sea is, of course, off the coast of uh, Alaska and uh, the U Yukon Territory and parts of the Northwest Territory. The Arctic is an unusual ocean in that it is stratified or layered by salinity instead of temperature. Refer to that video that I made where I showed you the, the Pacific halocline and the Atlantic halocline. Halocline, of course, is a reference to a sharp change in salt content. Most oceans of the world have warmer, lighter water near the surface and colder, denser water below. In the Arctic, however, there is a surface layer that is cold but very fresh. It is very fresh due to riverine uh, uh, input. You know, rivers empty their cold water into the ocean, as well as the ice melt. So you get basically a freshwater lens on top. Similar to what we see going on in the North Atlantic with the Greenland ice melting, you're adding a freshwater cap on top of the North Atlantic water there. Warm, relatively salty water enters from the Pacific through the Bering Strait, and then the Barrow Canyon off Alaska's northern coast, which kind of also helps squeeze water, fresh water that way. Also keep in mind, warm, relatively salty waters, actually a little saltier than what comes in the Pacific side, enters the Arctic Ocean from the Atlantic side through the Fram Strait. So keep in mind, there are two major sources of warm water that is helping to melt the sea ice. And by the way, and I've discussed with you uh, the work of Igor Semelotov, uh, you know, with his with the uh, methane plume and so on. Igor has also examined uh, the Barrow Halo Klein. Uh, he, he's done uh, research on that uh, before he moved on to the uh, the methane issue, kind of full time now. But so he's done some work there as well. Because this water is saltier than the Arctic surface water, it is dense enough to subduct or basically go below the fresh Arctic surface layer. And then that, in so doing, it creates pockets of very warm water that's below the surface. And the, these warm waters, that heat will diffuse upward. So it starts melting the ice from below. And scientists have been seeing these pockets of warm subsurface water strengthen over the last decade. And that's what they're calling these pockets of what they're calling the heat bombs. They're just stable enough to be able to last for months or years, and they start swirling. Basically, they start going, they start flowing in, in like eddy, circular eddies. Eddies are circular uh, water flows. If you look, for example, the Gulf Stream, you get what's called mesoscale eddies that pinch off the main flow. Mesoscale eddies um, on a basis of tens of kilometers to even a couple hundreds of kilometers in diameter. So we're also seeing these little uh, eddies uh, taking place underneath the, the surface waters. And how they move about is controlled overall by the main uh, surface flow and, and other main circulatory uh, flows that take place within the Arctic Ocean. Until now, the process by which the warm water subducts has neither been observed or understood. Without that understanding, climate scientists have been unable to include this important effect in forecast models, some of which under predict accelerating sea ice melts. That goes back to my point that the BOE now, when you redo the models, includes this information. Now that we have data, you know, we can now in, we can now put that into the heat budget. That um, basically the BOE might occur earlier in the sense of when the Arctic Ocean becomes ice-free year-round. And by the way, a lot of the research that I did was heat budgets, so. This is kind of, kind of similar to what I used to do. Given the influx of warm Pacific uh, origin water has been growing over the past decade or so, this work adds to a growing body of evidence that Arctic sea ice, source of global climate stability, could disappear for large portions of the year. 
right? We already touched upon that. In the 2018 expedition that the U.S. Office of Naval Research uh, funded, scientists uh, caught one of these uh, subduction events taking place. So they used a bunch of various uh, instruments to do so. And they're also, you know, you got the folks from NOAA, uh, Scripps, the uh, University of Miami, a whole bunch of folks uh, also collecting biological samples. And, and British German scientists were doing so because they were also looking at the, the biological productivity, nutritional uh, or nutrient aspect uh, of that as well. Because when you have this sub subduction, it's stirring things up. It's going to bring uh, some nutrients. So that will help productivity. But as I discussed in my ice algae uh, video, when you start losing the sea ice, you're losing the productivity from the algae that are found on the underside of the ice. So that is going to go away. Yes, you, you, you don't forget, you also have the ice edge productivity that takes place. So historically, you had three sources of productivity in the Arctic Ocean. You had the ice algae on the underside of the uh, ice create, doing their thing. Then as the sea ice would melt back, you get that little stratification from that freshwater lens there, you get ice edge productivity, another group of primary producers. And then as the sea ice really melted back and then the sun angle got sufficiently high enough, you had more of the open water that occurs during the summertime, you then had the uh, productivity of the open ocean, the diatoms and that sort of stuff. Well, as we're losing the sea ice, you're losing the productivity from the ice algae and the productivity from ice edge, different group of producers. So yes, while this mixing from the subducting warm water may help some productivity. When you look at the net productivity, it will be less. Because now you're going to be relying just pretty much on productivity from open water uh, phytoplankton. So they, the rest of it, they discuss some of the um, you know, instruments used here etc. And they start uh, congratulating themselves on the importance of collaboration with other institutions and, and there's researchers from other nations, which is all, of course, very good. I mean, I worked at the International uh, Arctic Research Center, where I worked with, you know, Korean, uh, South Korean, Chinese, Russian, Japanese scientists, uh, Norwegian, uh, French, and uh, scientists as well. So, yeah. <laughs> So let me uh, pull up this video here. It's captioned, so yeah. That's off uh, uh, Alaska, is Point Barrow. And that heat will diffuse up and melts the ice from below. These are those. Uh, little heat bombs that result that's indicating uh, eddy flows.
be always So there you have it, a uh, nice little video kind of uh, summing up. But uh, as I said, I discussed a lot of this in uh, my pr prior video, and I also tried to do in that video uh, calculations uh, at, of the amount of heat in, in the, uh, uh, how much joules being brought in. I also tried to relate to you the uh, the amount of water flowing in in terms of sea drips. So I was trying to do um, a little more quantifying in that video, but this basically is, is descriptive. It tells you kind of it gives you an idea of what's happening, but it, it's also kind of like, well, I, I don't want to sound immodest here, but it's like, yeah, it's kind of telling me I was right. You know, it's, uh, so there you have it. Uh, we have a, we have a better understanding of the mechanisms taking place. We can then therefore, uh, improve our modeling. And at the rate we're going, we're probably going to see a permanently blue ocean in the Arctic, uh, probably within, you know, 10 to 15 years, um, the models I've seen suggest that BOE, the first one will be uh, you know, next year, somewhere between 2022 and 2024. And where the Arctic is totally ice free for a couple of months, then it'll be four months, eight months, and finally year round by 2035. And as we keep heating up the ocean, right, and we're heating up the surface water, the water's flowing north. That's what, so we're bringing in this warm water from the Pacific. The, uh, the Japanese current that comes in is, a, uh, is, an, uh, is an extension of the Kuroshio current off the coast of Japan, which comes off the North Pacific gyra. So it originates in a subtropical water, so it's going to be warm. It brings that all the way up into the, into the Arctic Ocean. Same thing on the Atlantic side from the Gulf Stream. Brings in that warm water. And so these warm water plumes are helping to melt the ice earlier in the year. We know about, the, you know, with the loss of albedo and the open water absorbing the sun energy, we understand better why the ice forms up later in the year. Now we see in a mechanism, as I discussed to you in that prior video, I mean, I've been, I've been talking about, well, obviously not here, but in, discussions with my colleagues and some of the paper, some of the research done earlier, I was suggesting this mechanism. So, um, but there's more information for you. And um, I hope you found this interesting and gives you a better understanding of some of the dynamics uh, going on uh, in the Arctic Ocean, what affects sea ice and what that of course means you know, to the planet, to the global system and to the the global climate as well. I'm sure you guys can now uh, sit there and ruminate on this and apply everything you have uh, heard from me in these past couple of years. And uh, you can then see the extension to where things are headed. So thank you for your time. Hello, folks. This is Jim here with Science Talk, asking you to please subscribe to my channel and to inform others of my channel and of the work that I do. Please share to social media platforms that you use. Also, as a reminder, don't forget to click the bell so that you know when I load up more videos. Finally, I ask that you support the work that I do by becoming a patron at patreon.com. Details in the description box below. Thank you for your support.